All right, before we even start this interview, I just want everyone to know that this is my main man right here, Anthony Cocola. Anthony was an was a intern with us last summer, just an awesome guy, and now he's interviewing us for a, a school project. So this little context for the vlog, as well as the podcasters. Oh, the podcast. Yeah, we're the podcast is full force. So, dude, thanks for coming by, Thank brother. You. We got about 30 questions about your, should I look at the camera? Or no, man, you look at me. All right, cool. Um, so we're going to do about like 30 questions or so about your life. So you want to do like rapid fire style things? Or? So we could do, you know, rapido. Whatever you want, bro. Living, Whatever rapido. you want. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm just a small fish in your sea. Of course. Tell um, me. All right, so I guess we'll start off with going back to Butler University. And why did you choose com arts and English writing as a double major? So this is funny, actually. Uh, um, I went to Butler because I was recruited to play football, and it was the mm -hmm. best. It was the best school that recruited me at the time. It was a Division One AA school, mm -hmm. and I chose it because I wanted to play football at a Division One school, um, and I also wanted to be close enough to my parents' house where they could come watch me play and I was recruited by Butler and I was recruited by a school in Minnesota that had a great football program but it was seven and a half hours away. So I chose Butler and then two years into my football career I uh, was basically hit in the head a lot of times, mm -hmm. had to quit, had some concussion problems and at that time I was a business major and I hated it and I hated because I hated accounting Hated, hated the finance courses, hated the yeah. econ courses, hated all of it, and I became a communications major because I just have always liked the idea of communications. What's funny is the head of, the dean of the School of Business, I had to get his approval to switch out of the School of Business. He literally told me, you will never make any money unless <laughs> you're a business major. Oh, man. <laughs> so if you're watching this, you're all wrong. All doctors and you lawyers. Were you were wrong. <laughs> Um, um, and, 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 you know, I just like the idea of communications and writing and, and, and honestly, man, like I chose those majors because it was just like the next best thing. I didn't really know what I was doing. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So what life changing advice, um, you know where this is going to go. What life changing piece of advice did somebody give you in college? In college, life changing piece of advice? Two. Two of them. Does one of them involve... You can always come back here. <laughs> see, see, man, you know me so well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Scott Swanson, um, who was a, not even a professor of mine, he was just a friend of mine, a mentor. He was a professor. He was the head of the history department at Butler University. An incredible human, very compassionate, gentle, brilliant man. Um, you know, basically said, why don't you go, uh, why don't you go out and, and explore the world a little bit more? And at that time, all of my friends, I went to school in Indianapolis, all of my friends were moving to Chicago and, um, and getting jobs in Chicago. And, and I said, but you know, all my friends are moving to Chicago. And he said, well, you can always come back. And I suspect you won't want to. That was the exact line. And that was kind of, uh, at the time I thought, you know, come back to Illinois, come back to Chicago. But it, he was actually talking at, you know, as he normally did, much more sort of high level metaphorically than that, which was, you can always come back to the safety, uh, but you probably won't want to. And that, that's really honestly influenced my life in huge, huge ways. Um, and, and, you know, the other one was a guy named Andy Levy, who was my English professor. Mm -hmm. And he just said, um, now is the best time to fail. You're 22, you have really nothing to lose from the failure, so if it's time to fail, uh, if there's ever such thing as a time to fail, it's right now. And that the, those two men certainly changed my life. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you mentioned like your injury concussions with football. And how did these injuries motivate you like post-concussion the rest of your college career? It was just the first time that I ever had to be a human being Without my identify, without my identity being locked up in football, mm -hmm. you know, you have to understand. Like I come from the middle of America, 
where sports is the religion, mm -hmm. you know? And so when you get your foot, when, you get, when your life is stripped from you when you're 19 or 20, mm -hmm. and the only thing you've known since you were seven is football yeah. and is competition and is getting friends and leading and having, you know, six, seven, eight hours of your day every day accounted for because of that sport, you feel lost, mm -hmm. you know? And so I remember being so scared mm -hmm. after I stopped playing football because it was sort of like I was alone. I felt alone on an island. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the motivation came because I just, I desperately missed that connection and that, that community. And I thought to myself, how do I get it back? And that's when I started to do more with my fraternity, Sigma Chi. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started to make more friends like Scott and Andy who are older mm -hmm. and who are professors. And that's when I started to, to realize, oh my God, there's actually a lot more to this life mm -hmm. than what I've seen. And then Italy happened for a semester for me, uh, which opened my eyes even more. Then I took a trip to San Francisco, opened my eyes even more, and just one thing on top of the other. And um, I think that the motivation came from the fact that I needed to reinvent myself pretty rapidly, and I just did it through friends and travel and new experiences. Awesome. Um, so now, oh, after college, yeah. um, what like internship work experiences did you have? So after college, I didn't have any internships, but I did have uh, some very powerful work experiences. I went to work for Mike Bloomberg. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, that was after law school. After college, I went to work at uh, AmeriCorps, actually. And AmeriCorps, for, for the people that don't know, is a domestic Peace Corps, basically. And honestly, the, uh, the salary was $11,800 a year. Mm -hmm. So I was making about $900 a month. And I was living in San Francisco. And that was probably the best experience of my life because it was the first time that I realized that I, did, I really didn't need a lot of stuff to be happy. I was actually extremely happy in that time. And then, um, and then I went to law school at CUNY and then I graduated and worked for Bloomberg uh, on his reelection campaign as well as in his administration. And then five and a half years ago, I started my own business, which is what I do now, a life in shorts, communications digital media company. And I speak around the world for a living. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It is. <laughs> so, um, what, because obviously um, y you didn't actually like practice law even though you had a law degree, yep. what made you want to get a law degree? I wanted to be the mayor of New York City. So, I, I thought that I, I loved New York City so much. Mm -hmm. I saw so much injustice. And I thought to myself, um, you know, it's funny, I was in San Francisco one night and I was teaching and I was very close to my students. I taught in an eighth grade classroom. These are 12, 13, 14 year old kids from the, the roughest of the rough neighborhoods of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And there was not even about 90% Latino, about 8% African American, 2% white. And I was extremely close with the kids. And one night I walked out of the school and I saw a girl, one of my favorite students, eating out of the trash. And she was literally putting food from the trash into a little box. And I caught, I, I left at like eight o'clock at night, which was way later than anyone ever left. Mm -hmm. And I saw her and, she, and I said, Maria, what are you doing? And she was startled because she didn't think I saw her. She didn't think anybody would be in the school. And then she said, well, we, we don't have any food at home. Our food stamps ran out last week. And uh, I, my mom sent me out to find food. And in that moment, and I knew her mom really well, and her mom was a very, very hardworking woman. Um, but it just wasn't enough, you know? And so I remember thinking to myself, there's gotta be more that I can do. And I thought, what if I could influence the policy that, you know, what if, what if I can get them more food stamp money or what if there's other ways that they could get more food? So I thought it would be nice to become a politician. And that's why I went to law school and that's why I worked for the mayor because I wanted to see how to do it. And what I realized was that like, even Bloomberg who was the, Actually, I should say, aside from Bloomberg, who was the best politician, who was my favorite politician I've ever met, um, who really didn't have to cater to anybody's special interest because he had so much money. Mm -hmm. If you're not Bloomberg and you're not a billionaire, you just have to do a lot of crappy things that you don't believe in mm -hmm. to move one thing that you do believe in forward. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be a part of it. So 
Uh, that's why I decided that, that running for mayor was no longer a thing that I wanted to do. But I did like the idea of, of influencing people through words and if helping them have their best life. And that's why I started what I do now. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you went on a life-changing trip to the Dominican Republic when you were 24? Yep. Right? Good yeah. research, man. There we go. You really you did, you did your homework here. Wow, it's like I know you or something. <laughs> Um, so how did helping, um, work with the orphanages and shutting down waste plants, like how did, how did that fuel and connect with what you're currently doing at a life insurance? I love the question. There's a couple things. The first thing it did was it fueled perspective mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. 125 kids lived in this orphanage. 125 kids had the worst stories you could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. Ever. Ever. Raped. Abandoned tied up to beds burned with hot coals tied up to beds for three or four days while mom went out and tried to find clients that she could have sex with like the worst stories you could imagine um, Almost every single one of those kids Gave me something the last night almost every single one of those kids gifted me something that was perspective These kids that have nothing that have been through the worst imaginable situations were so generous that was it. That was a game changer for me. That was the moment that I decided that for the rest of my life I was going to devote myself to serving Latin American communities. <laughs> That's number one. Number two, how it connects to life in shorts is everything that I've ever done in my entire life has depended on my ability to tell a story. Mm -hmm. Getting them to shut down that trash dump, getting money to even go there, putting together a portfolio of people uh, to fundraise on behalf of the orphanage, all of it required money. All of it required influence and all of it required a specific action, all of, it, all of it which was driven by a story. The story of the girls or the story of me or the story of the trash dump or the story of the x-rays and the sicknesses and, right? And that was the kind of like the third or fourth time in my life that I had seen that, you know what, this is actually, the story is actually so core to the success or the failure of whatever you wanted to do, mm -hmm. that I knew that I had this skill for it and that I could use it to drive good. You mentioned working on Mayor Bloomberg's reelection campaign. Yeah. Um, and you worked in Washington Heights. Yeah. So, how did the people and the voters of Washington Heights influence you or impact your life? I just love Latinos. I think that there's so much energy and so much zest for life. And so much humility, um, that is something that I think is something we could all learn about. Uh, it influenced me for a couple different reasons. Number one, I was blown away at how dedicated to community that neighborhood is. We got 600 volunteers in four months, mm -hmm. right? And that was my job. I was in charge of recruiting the volunteers. We got 600 in four months that gave up their time for free. Mm -hmm. We weren't guaranteed, we weren't promising them anything. and. So it was just like, wow, people do believe in a bigger cause. The other thing I would say is like, it showed me the value of treating people well. There was a conversation that I had with one of my bosses during that time where he said that I was being too nice to the volunteers and that I should put up more of a professional front. And I told him that the minute that we did that, they would leave. And he luckily gave me a couple of weeks to prove myself and the numbers just kept growing so quickly that he, he eventually stepped out. I think that there's this massive misconception that you have to motivate people by fear or by separationalism. Mm -hmm. And I just completely disagree with that. I think that you motivate people by treating them better than they've ever been treated before. And that's what happens. And that's what I try to do with the staff here. And that's what I try to do with my family. That's what I try to do with my girlfriend. That's what I try to do with my friends. Like it's just across the board mm -hmm. what I believe in. Yeah. Um, so after your work with the mayor, you worked for the uh, DCA, and you worked under, it was John Mintz, Yeah, right? Jonathan Mintz. Um, so what was it like working with, it was a large staff, correct? Huge, yeah, 300 people. Yeah. What was it like being sort of the liaison between the commissioner and 300 people? So it's funny that you asked me that, and the only reason you can ask me that question that well prepared is because you do know me so well. Yeah. So f just to kind of back up, the, I was his special assistant, so I was in charge of doing all kinds mm -hmm. of different things. Some of them which are, were preparing him speaking points and talking points, preparing him for city hall testimonial, preparing him for congressional testimonial. 
And in a lot of ways, I, I joke with him. I'm still friends with him. He's an incredible man and a phenomenal leader. Um, I joke with him now and I say, when we have a drink, I say, you know, I, I actually think I should have paid you <laughs> for hiring me because I learned so much from him. And I didn't even realize how much I was learning from him until after I got out of the agency. But what he used to say to me is like, you're invaluable to me because you have such an incredible pulse on the other things that are happening in this agency, meaning the other people. So to answer your question you know, more directly with that kind of context, I just love people so much that water cooler time to me is way more interesting than most things. And so um, what made people tick and what made people inspired to do things is so fascinating to me. And so um, I think that that was the role that I played more than anything was being able to get a take the temperature of the agency. And for me, that's just second nature because mm-hmm. I've done it my whole life with my friends, with the football team, with the fraternity, with my family. Like I just basically know what everyone's thinking without them having to say a word. And um, that was useful. And that's a, that's been a very useful skill for me. Mm-hmm. And on top of working between your boss and the 300 employees, you worked for the department, between the department, I mean, with uh, between the department and City Hall. So what was that dynamic, you know, city government like? I will say, you know, certainly there was like a lot of bureaucracy within the agency mm-hmm. that, that slowed things down a little bit. But Jonathan and Mayor Bloomberg were both so business driven. Mm-hmm. Uh, in other words, they cared so much more about the results than they did about the accolades. Like Jonathan would just just got so much stuff done, and um, it was incredible to see how much he got done inside of a government agency. Mm-hmm. And he he kept things very nimble and he kept things very fast. And his the six or seven you know highest level people around him were extremely smart, and um, and I think that like that was inspiring to watch. And in terms of City Hall, the the you know the mayor himself, he, you know he runs a massive, one of the biggest companies in the world. So he knows, he takes a very business driven approach to Mm -hmm. governing and like it was just the, I I can't imagine not working in that kind of environment. Like I've heard my other friends that have told horror stories around bureaucracy and and government. I think that both of those men did such a freaking good job of not, um, of not succumbing to like the red tape and moving things along super fast. So that was inspiring to see. Yeah. Um, so you wrote speeches for Commissioner Mintz. So I was wondering what, I actually want to change this question to, yeah. what's the difference between writing a TED Talk or an Afro Bites conference speech and writing a speech for the commissioner to give to New York One, let's just say? So I think the big difference is it's, it's not mine, mm-hmm. right? Like when I give a speech at a conference, um, or when I gave my TED, one of, you know, both of my TED Talks, it was 100% my content. Mm-hmm. And I decided what to do with it. What I, th- what I found exciting about writing speeches for Jonathan and talking points and press releases and anything else that I did for him in, in the messaging world was he would say, here's 25, 50, 75 pieces of information, whether it be articles or newspaper, or, you know, papers or city or, or, or um, legislation. And here are the four or five people that you should work with inside of the agency to come up with the talking points or the speech or the questions that they're probably going to ask me and the answers to those questions. That is a skill that I've really been able to apply to the startups that I coach, to the executives that I coach, to the branding clients that we get. I am able to, in a very short period of time, take a tremendous amount of information and get right to the heart of what that message should be, whether it be for a product or a service or a human being, and that is a tremendous gift. And I honed that with him so much, and that's easily the greatest thing that I walked away with from a professional standpoint, aside from just watching a great leader be a great leader. Yeah. Um, So, uh, what did your first, it was two years you spent in Silicon Valley, right? No, five. Five. Five years in Silicon Valley, yeah. I'm I'm rusty here. That's all right. What did those years (coughs) teach you about the industry that you're in today? You know, I think that the industry, so Silicon Valley for me was really exciting because there's a lot of ideas. 
-hmm. You know, New York City has a lot of ideas too, but it's so big and there's so much just like daily grind that you, you just try to, trying to basically make it through the day in, in a lot of ways, especially if I was in law school and you know working as a young professional. Um, Silicon Valley for me was kind of a, a, a deep breath moment, but also like a deep breath moment for um, with a lot of ideas happening. And so I think Silicon Valley for me represented number one ideas, number two, um, just really, really smart people. And I think that, you know, what I learned was that a lot of skills can be transferable. So like the stuff I was doing with Bloomberg and Jonathan were, was transferable to a startup tech founder who needed to pitch venture capitalists but didn't have any idea how to do it because they were so smart and so technical that the storytelling was completely lost on them. So that was an exciting transferable skill. I think I realized that like what you're good at, you're good at no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you expanded your company yep. to Medellin, Colombia. Yep. Um, like two years ago, right? Yeah, About a year, a year and a half ago. Year and a yep. half ago. Um, so why of all the Latin American cities that you have visited or just know about, did you pick Medellin? I think two big reasons. Number one, I just love the city. Like mm -hmm. aesthetically, I think it's beautiful. I think the people are super nice. I think um, the temperature, the climate is nice. Um, I just I just fell in love with it. There's bamboo. There's there's good transportation. It's, it's a relatively inexpensive place to live for Americans. Um, that's the sort of like you know I always say there's a good answer and there's a real re real answer. The good answer is I love the place. The real answer and probably way more exciting to you and and to the people that know Medellin well is for generations now they've been defined by violence and cocaine mm -hmm. and prostitutes and gangs and FARC and kidnappings. And when I got down there, I didn't really know what to expect. And what you find when you actually get there is an appetite so large for innovation and so large to change that dialogue mm -hmm. that I wanted to be a part of it. This is the first generation, you know, like people our age yeah. are the first ones in 100 years or 50 years that actually have the power to change things because it's just not as near, nearly as bad as it used to be. Mm -hmm. And they are taking that commitment so seriously mm -hmm. to build something really cool. And I wanted to contribute in my own way to change the image that the world had of Colombia and what Colombia actually is because it's unbelievably cool and progressive and, and amazing. And if I could play a, part, a small part in that, I, I wanted to. And um, mm -hmm. that's why I chose Medellin. Do you see it as Latin America's Silicon Valley? In, in some ways, yeah. I mean, they're still further behind than Silicon Valley, but um, I think they're trying. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, there's like Route to NA is popping up, you know, a few years ago. It's a really amazing, amazing place. Uh, there are more and more accelerators and incubators popping up. And I think that in a lot of ways, it, I mean, I think it was ranked as South America's most innovative city. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think in a lot of ways it is, you know, I think that, there's an appetite, and I think when there's an appetite and you've been suppressed for so long, then really cool things happen. I think that that's, that's where they're at. So in the three cities that you've built your business in, what was sort of the difference in whether how you felt about the city? Um, I love the question. Yeah. San Francisco was the perfect place to build the business. Mm -hmm. So I spent the first four and a half years or five years even building the business in San Francisco mm -hmm. because there was so few distractions mm -hmm. and because it was quiet and because I had a gorgeous apartment that I worked out of, the view of the Bay Bridge and the view of, and I think that for me, San Francisco was the perfect place to build. Medellin was a great place to turn that business into a bilingual brand um, mm -hmm. and to have some great talent work and to maintain that Latin American presence. And then New York um, is just the opportunity capital of the world. Mm -hmm. And in any minute, your life, complete life can change. In, in with one meeting on one train or one meeting at one dinner meeting. Mm -hmm. And that, for me, New York, so it was a good place to build in San Francisco made a lot of sense. To expand in New York made a lot of sense. And then to uh, basically turn all of that into a bilingual brand in a place that I love with a lot of opportunity. 
-hmm. Those are the three reasons, and that was the, that's the three feelings I have for those cities. Yeah. So you now write for the Huffington Post, mm -hmm. right? Um, so and Entrepreneur Magazine now. And, oh, you got at it. We got in. Hey. We got in, but we, the articles have not been approved yet. They're okay. And I used to write for Forbes, but not anymore. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say, what's the difference between writing between um, like Huffington or Entrepreneur and writing now for um, or on the side writing like LinkedIn articles or media articles? Again, the I think that. The censorship, and this is something that I'm obsessed with, mm -hmm. the censorship when you write your own articles is zero. Yeah. When you post them on LinkedIn, you post them on your blog, you post them on Medium, like mm -hmm. nobody can tell me no. And it's funny that you asked that because just yesterday I was talking like how can I create the next Forbes? How can I create the next thing that, no, that I get to be the gatekeeper? Mm -hmm. You know, a big, a big challenge that I have with all of these publications is They'll say no to stories that I want to publish because they don't like them. Or they'll say no because they don't think it, there's something wrong with them, but I know they're good stories. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I just, whenever your yes is in someone else's hands, that scares the crap out of me, Anthony. Yeah. Like, I like to have complete control of my yeses and my noes. And um, I'm actually thinking through a lot right now. I'm having several preliminary conversations with people about how to build the next media empire. Mm -hmm. where I'm pushing out the content, I'm creating the content, or I'm curating the content. And um, mm -hmm. that's the biggest difference. The power. The power of them versus me. I like to have the power. Awesome. So, at a life in shorts, you create content uh, mostly for nonprofits and like organizations? All Yeah, all sizes. All, all sizes. sizes. But um, when I was here, we were yep. like, doing a lot yep. of nonprofit work. Yep. And what is that experience been like working with these nonprofits to sort of get their really positive social message out there? I think it's like anything, man, like mm -hmm. that you just have to know that there's a lot of competing, mm -hmm. there's a lot of competing noise. There's a lot of competition. You have to be strategic about the content that you create and about where you distribute it and how you distribute it. And I think that, you know, one thing that we've done really well is figure out at the crux of everything is the story. Who are you as a human? What, what, like, what do you do as a human being? Mm -hmm. And that for people, whether you're an initiative or an organization or a nonprofit or a philanthropy or whatever, that for people is so hard. Mm -hmm. Being able to f like figure out like, what, who am I? That's hard for people, man. So we've been able to identify that for people and I think that's a huge value. Then we create content on top of that. It's just that I think where a lot of people mess up is they're trying too hard to create content without having a clear vision of why. Mm -hmm. um, you document, as you're doing right now, your daily work in the office. Yep. Or just... As much as we can. With as many interesting people you have come in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, and you also do podcasts. So, like, what was... How does that sort of tie into the successes that you've had? I... A lot, and it's 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 so fun. Like you're 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 really doing a great job with this interview, man. I'm, I'm impressed. Mm -hmm. um, I just believe so much. I mean, I document my day for a couple of reasons. Number one, I just think it's fun to have. I actually don't care if anyone watches it. I think it's fun to have. I think it's going to be fun to look back on, mm -hmm. um, and I think it's going to be fun for. You know, I think that we can always reuse content, recycle content to like you know, for whatever we want, to say, hey, I told you so, or hey, like, you know. Um, but I just think that there's this idea of pull versus push marketing that I'm obsessed with. Push marketing is like, hey, Anthony, hire me. Hey, Nick, hire me. Hey, Tech Suite, hire me, mm -hmm. right? And that's tr historical marketing, yeah. and that's tried and tested, and it's always gonna be there. The problem is, there are so many more people now coming into this ecosystem of entrepreneurship that it becomes so crowded mm -hmm. and everyone's trying to sell you everything. So instead, I took a different approach, which was, I still do a lot of the sales, don't get me wrong, I don't get that twisted, but I decided to add a pull marketing department, a pull marketing concept, which is put out as much information as I possibly can to the world and see what happens, see what comes to me. And because of that, I've gotten opportunities to speak, I've gotten clients, I've gotten sponsorship opportunities, like a lot of stuff happens. And you know, our, our, our numbers are low. 
like relatively speaking. And this is another thing that I really want to share with people, which is we have 22 views on some YouTube videos, but one of those views could lead to a $5,000 deal. Or one of those views could introduce me to someone that could change my life in five years. You just don't know. But you'll never know the value of what you're doing until you can put something out there all the time. So, um, I guess we'll just like go to the next one. Yeah, next one. All right, so let's talk about your TED Talks. Um, so you've done two TED Talks. Yep. And I was just wondering <clears throat> if you were nervous going into these because they're you know a bigger platform. And uh, if you were to do a third talk, if there was potentially one in the works, what would you do it on? So the first TED Talk I was extremely nervous for. Mm -hmm. um, it was pretty early on in my career. I, I, I slept very little the night before. I was very nervous. Mm -hmm. um, the second one I was not nervous at all, just because it was you know six months ago and I, at this point I had five years of experience under my belt. I knew what I was gonna say. Mm -hmm. um, and if I were to do a third one, I would probably do it on turning yourself into a media company. I think that that's something I'm very passionate about, the opportunities that we have as personal brands to turn ourselves into a media company and, and to get, be everywhere. Uh, that's probably what i do the third one on. Mm -hmm. Although I had one idea once for a TED Talk where the topic was, I think, like getting out of your comfort zone. Yeah. That was like the TEDx, like, you know, theme, and I submitted a proposal to stand on stage for 11 minutes, the, the limit was 12 minutes per talk, mm -hmm. and my proposal was to stand on stage for 11 minutes and 52 seconds and not say a word, and in the last eight seconds just be like, <laughs> how comfortable are you with silence? Get out of your comfort zone. <laughs> They said no. That would be the <laughs> third and final type <laughs> They said no. They said no. <laughs> Okay, so um, what other you know big conferences, keynotes, talks have you enjoyed as an entrepreneur? Like, what were some of your favorites to do? I so I've given a few. So I, I gave the keynote at my Sigma Chi leadership training workshop. Is that the one? Which that was, was uh, I decided one? No, that so that I decided it was really fun too. I decided it was in my hometown, Peoria, mm -hmm. uh, kind of an empowerment conference where I talked about branding and, and digital media and doing what you love. Um, but the the um, the Sigma Chi one was, I think, about 3,500 um, in the audience. It was the biggest mm -hmm. crowd I've had so far. And it was really special because, you know, my grandfather was the reason that I became a Sigma Chi in the first place. Um, and to be able to give that talk, I knew he'd be super proud. And also, you know, it was, it was a big talk, 3,500 people. And I received a standing ovation at the end. I remember that feeling really, like really powerful. Um, but I enjoyed that. I, I always enjoy speaking down in Colombia um, at Tatiana Arias' con conference that she always invites me to come, you know, speak at the Felicidad Financiera. That's always a fun talk in Bogota. Um, I enjoyed speaking in Russia a lot. There was a great turnout university in Moscow. Um, we talked about public speaking and personal branding. Great, great conversation. I, honestly, I enjoy, I, I enjoy all of them. The one that I probably, the group of people that I probably enjoy talking to more than anybody is Hostos Community College, which is a CUNY school up in the South Bronx. Mm -hmm. And the, I just absolutely adore the students. And hungry, scrappy, fiery immigrant entrepreneur types. Mm -hmm. Just love it. So I'm in my glory when I'm up there, and I actually have a talk coming up there next Friday, couple, November 11th, um, and I, I really love it. Future interns, you think you'll meet them? Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Possible, yeah, <laughs> we'll totally <see>. possible. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so um, you do Q and A's on your channel. Love it, um, love Q&A's. Now you're the one getting the question. Yes. Yeah. So how, how do you prepare for you know doing these Q and A's with a whole array of different people. So, you know, writing for big publications was definitely helpful in crafting and honing my question asking skill. Um, I think when I have people onto the show, I don't, I don't prepare much at all, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I used to, for the Forbes articles, I used to prepare a lot. Um, and now I kind of like to see more what flows. I have a list of questions ready in case they get quiet, but for the most part, I know the people that are coming on. 
and uh, I know their story, and I we can kind of just jam. Um, but I, I always ask them beforehand, like, there's, is there anything that you really want to talk about on the show? And they usually say one or two things, and then the rest of it's kind of up to me. So I play it by ear. Awesome. Yeah. Um, now, you like building personal connections with people, especially, you know, you, you're one of those people who likes to have a personal relationship with somebody yep. outside of just, like, the cold business transaction. Yep. Um, so how do you maintain these connections and relationships that you've built all across the world? The the true answer is it's it's really hard. Mm-hmm. Um, I struggle with it a lot. And struggle is the wrong word. It's just, it's, it's something that I give a lot of thought to, mm-hmm. right? And so there are a couple different answers. Number one, it's, it, it just, it's just like anything, it's just time and commitment. Sometimes I'm great at it, sometimes I'm awful at it, and I just kind of give myself permission to be wherever I'm at with that, mm-hmm. um, doing the best that I can, There's stuff that pops up. The other thing that I would say is I, I try to add more value than I receive from basically every single person in the world. Mm-hmm. And when I am happiest, and this is funny, I actually gave this some thought, I'm actually very uncomfortable with receiving things to the point where like, Mm -hmm. if someone starts to give me a massage, my instant, instant instinct is to start massaging them. And it's it's weird. Like I just I just noticed it the other day with my girlfriend. She's like rubbing my back, and I'm like, oh, rub your back too. (laughs) Like it's weird. I think that I have a mother who was the easily the most generous person I've ever met. Like she would give you her whole leg if you were like, mom, I can't walk. She would just cut off her leg and give it to you. Mm-hmm. I saw that from my whole life, and so I'm, I'm extremely uncomfortable with receiving, mm-hmm. which actually works to my benefit because almost everybody else in the world is taking more than they're giving, mm-hmm. and I think that that's been a big reason that I've been able to have these relationships all over the mm-hmm. world that you, that you mentioned. Yeah. Shout out to Mrs. Rashid. Love you, Mom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... How much time do you spend um, working per week? All of it. All of it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, except when you're that, sleeping. Basically. But that's not a joke. Yeah. Like per week, all of it. I will say this: I need sleep. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not. I, I I think that if you're selling, you say you need four or five hours of sleep a night, I'm either extremely jealous of you, or I'm really worried that you're gonna like die. Mm-hmm. So um, if it's true, it's great. I so. I actually pr- stay pretty disciplined about sleep. I try to get seven, eight, n- even if I can get nine hours a night, I do. Even if it means I come in a little bit later than I want to, mm-hmm. because probably what's happened is the night before I'm up working. So during the week, I'm working at basically every single minute of the day. And working, you know, looks a lot of different ways. Like sometimes it's in here you know, directing the team. Sometimes it's in here working on letters. Sometimes I'm responding to emails. Sometimes I'm at events or dinners or, but I will say like, aside from time with like my romantic partner, which I have zero business agenda with, Mm -hmm. everything is basically about business. True. Even my friendships. But the cool thing is this, Anthony, and that might sound a little bit weird for people. The cool thing is I've surrounded myself with so many entrepreneurial type Mm -hmm. people that also want to have business conversations when we're out. Like I spent the day mm-hmm. on two, on Monday in California with my best friend Alex. We talked about business and we talked about business decisions almost the entire day. Mm-hmm. But uh, we loved it. Like it, the, I, I don't know what else we would be talking about, right? So is it um, therapeutic in a way when you both tell each other like what? Yeah, it's it's therapeutic yeah. and it's also just like wow, we're actually making a lot of progress. Like he's making some big shifts. Um, you know, we're, I'm, I'm trying to decide how to grow this thing properly. Like, it's just fun. And so every minute I'm working. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Your network is your net worth. Hey. hey. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I feel like this is probably an obvious yes, but do you feel like you enjoy this very compact work schedule or do you find it overwhelming? I times? enjoy it. The place I don't enjoy it so much and the place that I that I always try to figure out a way to work less is when I'm traveling. Mm-hmm. So an ideal thing for me, it's funny that you ask because I actually on the flight out or when I was out in California last week, I wrote down like a list of things that I love because mm-hmm. I just wanted to like connect with myself again to make sure that I'm doing a lot of the things that I love. And I think that like 
went out, well, so I was in Moscow last year. I was there for seven days. Four of them were very packed business days. Two and a half of them were free, and then the other half was kind of like a travel miscellaneous. Um, I liked that flow. I, when I'm in New York, I'm fine working. I mean, I'll take, I'll take, I'll, I'll usually take like a day off a week, like mm-hmm. Sunday all day off. Sometimes I'll take Saturday and Sunday all day off. Just depends. Um, but I like when I'm in New York, kind of cranking. When I'm in a new place, I like to take some time to explore, and have some time to think. So. Um, I don't want to be working every minute of the day. It's just kind of what I'm doing now because I'm, you know, I'm growing. We're growing a team. There's a lot of growing pains. There's more mouths to feed, which means we have to make more money, which means, you know, so that's kind of where I'm at. Um, so where do you see, actually, you know what, I I want to ask this one first. Go for it. If you could go back to yourself, 15 to... 20 years ago. So I'm th- I'm 34 now, so that would be 14, it'd be 14 to 19. So I'm like li- I'm like high school, like high school. Yeah, at your high school, college, early college self, where did you think you would be right now? It's funny. I th- I thought Well, I can't say I thought I'd be in New York cuz I'd never visited. Mhm. So, but I thought for my whole life, I've basically thought the same thing, which was, I'm going to help millions of people. And I never knew how that would look. I'm gonna help millions of people with my words. I remember I used to tell my mom, she, she jokes with me, what's up mom again? Um, I, used to, I used to, as a child, well, two things. First of all, I used to follow her around when I was like three, four, five years old. I used to follow her around all day and I would just ask her the same question over and over and over again. I would say, mommy, are you happy? In, so, like, think about what that means. Mm-hmm. Embedded in my DNA, like embedded in me from three, four, five, I had an innate desire for the people around me to be happy. Mm-hmm. In, like, and it was just my mom in that moment because that was the person I was spending all the time with, following her around the house all day, asking her that question. I think that in my core as a human, all I want, literally all I want, is for the people around me to be happy. And that's a big motivation behind what I do, which is like helping people find careers that can make them happy and figure out ways to make your thing that you love, that makes you happy, make you money. Um, And then the second part of that I think is, I've told her for a very, very, very long, I remember remember in high school telling her, sitting at at a Mexican restaurant, actually I was in college, sitting at a Mexican restaurant, I had a vest on, and I said, Mom, I'm gonna help millions of people. And at that point, the internet was just kind of like getting going. Like yeah. we were just starting to learn about it. And so now it could be billions, you know? And now, the, now it could be billions of people. But I've always had this feeling that I'm gonna be like very influential. And I still have that feeling deep inside of me. Cool. So now that we've talked about your past self, where do you <laughs> see a life insurance, like where do you feel like you're gonna lead it with your vision in five years? You know, f- five years I think my, my vision is I wanna be taking on insanely cool projects. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that we have a couple of them now. I think that in five years we'll have even more of a content database built up. We'll be even better at social. We'll be even better at the distribution. Um, so I think that like taking on really, really big things and being a part of really big things would be exciting. And then I want to continue speaking. I mean, my, my goal has always been to become a household sort of iconic entrepreneur type. Mm-hmm. People know about me. People say hi to me on the street, on the, in the airport. Like, I love that. Yeah. I've tasted it a little bit. Like there's been a couple of people that have come up to me in the last year and been like, hey, you're Brian. Um, and it's just unbelievable. But my core value is really the same, which is to serve people and to help people. I think there's so much sadness in the world. I think there's so many people doing things they don't want to do. It makes me really sad. And um, if I can play some small part in like helping you find out what is your thing, what is your important message, how do you transmit it, and then how do you monetize it, if that is what you want, mm-hmm. that'd be a real full life. Yeah. 
Yeah. So five years or 50 years, my answer will probably be the same. Awesome. I mean, that's all the questions I have. But cool. yeah, um, that's that's all we got. Dude, it's okay. so good to see I you, brother. <laughs> Thank you for coming by, bro. We killed it. Anthony Cocola, follow this man. He is a I'll, legend. I'll give you my social handle. Love you, bro. I barely post, but... <laughs> Thanks.